Pilate pronounces the sentence of death against the author of life. The Lord takes up the cross on which he is to die. His most holy mother follows him. What she did on this occasion to restrain the devil and other happenings. To the great satisfaction and joy of the priests and Pharisees, Pilate then decreed the sentence of death on the cross against life itself, Jesus, our Savior. Having announced it to the one they had thus condemned in spite of his innocence, they brought him to another part of the house of Pilate, where they stripped him of the purple mantle, in which they had derided him as mock king. All happened by the mysterious dispensation of God, though on their part it was due to the concerted malice of the Jews, for they wished to see him undergo the punishment of the cross in his own clothes, so that in them he might be recognized by all. Only by his garments could he now be recognized by the people, since his face had been disfigured beyond recognition by the scourging, the impure spittle, and the crown of thorns. They again clothed him with the seamless tunic, which at the command of the queen was brought to him by the angels, for the executioners had thrown it into a corner of another room in the house, where they left where they left it to place upon him the mocking and scandalous purple cloak. But the Jews neither understood nor noticed any of these circumstances, since they were too much taken up with the desire of hastening his death. Through the diligence of the Jews in spreading the news of the sentence decreed against Jesus of Nazareth, the people hastened in multitudes to the house of Pilate in order to see him brought forth to execution. Since the ordinary number of inhabitants was increased by the gathering of numerous strangers from different parts to celebrate the Pash, the city was full of people. All of them were stirred by the news and filled the streets up to the very palace of Pilate. It was a Friday, the day of the Parasev, which in Greek signifies preparation or getting ready, for on that day the Jews prepared themselves or got ready for the ensuing Sabbath, their greatest feast, on which no servile work was to be performed, not even such as cooking meals. All this had to be done on this Friday. In the sight of all those multitudes, they brought forth our Savior in his own garments, and with a countenance so disfigured by wounds, blood, and spittle, that no one would have, have that no one would have again recognized him as the one they had seen or known before. At the command of his afflicted mother, the holy angels had a few times wiped off some of the impure spittle, but his enemies had so persistently continued in their disgusting insults that now he appeared altogether covered by their vile expectorations. At the sight of such a sorrowful spectacle, a confused shouting and clamor arose from the people so that nothing could be understood, but all formed one uproar and confusion of voices. But above all the rest were heard the shouts of the priests and Pharisees, who in their unrestrained joy and exultation harangued the people to become quiet and clear the streets through which the divine victim was to pass, in order that they might hear the sentence of death proclaimed against him. The people were divided and confused in their opinions, according to the suggestions of their own hearts. At this spectacle were present different kinds of people who had been who had benefited and who had been benefited and succored by the miracles and the kindness of Jesus, and such as had heard and accepted his teaching and had become his followers and friends. These now showed their sympathy, some in bitter tears, other by asking what this man had done to deserve such punishment. Others were dumbfounded and began to be troubled and confused by this universal confusion and tumult. Of the eleven apostles, St. John alone was present. He, with the sorrowful mother and the three Marys, stood within sight of the Lord, though in a retired corner. When the holy apostle saw his divine master brought forth, the thought of whose love toward himself now shot through his mind, and he was so filled with grief that his blood congealed in his veins and his face took on the appearance of death. The three Marys fell away into a prolonged swoon, but the queen of virtues remained unconquered, and her magnanimous heart, though overwhelmed by a grief beyond all conception of man, never fainted or swooned. She did not share the imperfections or weaknesses of the others. In all her actions, she was most prudent, courageous, and admirable. 
Calmly she comforted St. John and the pious women. She besought the Lord to strengthen them in order that she might have their company to the end of the Passion. In virtue of this prayer, the Apostle and the holy women were consoled and encouraged so that they regained their senses and could speak to the mistress of heaven. Amid all this bitterness and confusion, she did nothing unbecoming or inconsiderate, but shed forth incessant tears with the dignity of a queen. Her attention was riveted upon her son, the true God. She prayed to the Eternal Father and offered to him his sorrows and torments, imitating in her actions all that was done by our Savior. She recognized the malice of sin, penetrated the mysteries of the redemption, appealed to the angels and interceded for friends and enemies while giving way to her maternal love and to the sorrows corresponding to it. She at the same time practiced all the virtues, exciting the highest admiration of all heaven and delighting in the highest degree the eternal Godhead. Since it is not possible for me to describe the sentiments filling the heart of this mother of wisdom, nor those at times also uttered by her lips, I leave them to be imagined by Christ Christian piety. The servants and priests sought to quiet the multitudes in order that they might be able to hear the sentence pronounced against Jesus of Nazareth, for after it had been made known to him in person, they desired to have it read before the people and in his presence. When the people had quieted down, they began to read it in a loud voice so that all could hear it while Jesus was standing in full view as a criminal. The sentence was proclaimed also in the different streets and at the foot of the cross, and it was afterwards published and spread in many copies. According to the understanding given to me, the copies were a faithful reproduction, excepting some words which have been added. I will not discuss them, for the exact words of this sentence have been shown me, and I give them here without change. Literal rendering of the sentence of death pronounced against Jesus of Nazareth, our Savior. I, Pontius Pilate, presiding over Lower Galilee and governing Jerusalem in fealty to the Roman Empire and being within the executive mansion, judge, decide, and proclaim that I condemn to death Jesus of the Nazarene people and a Galilean by birth, a man seditious and opposed to our laws, to our Senate, and to the great Emperor, Tiberius Caesar. For the execution of this sentence, I decree that his death be upon the cross, and that he shall be fastened thereto with nails, as is customary with criminals. Because in this very place, gathering around him every day, many men, poor and rich, he has continued to raise tumults, tumults throughout Judea, proclaiming himself the Son of God and King of Israel at the same time threatening the ruin of this renowned city of Jerusalem and its temple, and of the sacred empire, refusing tribute to Caesar, and because he dared to enter in triumph this city of Jerusalem and the temple of Solomon, accompanied by a great multitude of the people carrying branches of palms. I commanded the first centurion, called Quintus Cornelius, to lead him for his greater shame through the said city of Jerusalem, bound as he is and scourged by my orders. Let him also wear his own garments, that he may be known to all, and let him carry the cross on which he is to be crucified. Let him walk through all the public streets between two other thieves, who are likewise condemned to death for their robberies and murders, so that this punishment be an example to all the people and to all malefactors. Excuse me. I desire also and command in this my sentence that this malefactor, having been thus led through the public streets, be brought outside the city through the Pagora Gate, now called the Antonian Portal, and under the proclamations of the herald who shall mention all the crimes pointed out in my sentence, he shall be conducted to the summit of the mountain called Calvary, where justice is wont to be executed upon wicked transgressors. There, fastened and crucified upon the cross which he shall carry, as decreed above, his body shall remain between the aforesaid thieves. Above the cross, that is, at its top, he shall have place for him his name and title in the three languages, namely in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, and in all and each one of them shall be written 
This is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, so that it may be understood by all and become universally known. At the same time, I command that no one, no ma matter of what condition, under pain of the loss of his goods and life, and under punishment for rebellion against the Roman Empire, presume audaciously to impede the execution of this just sentence ordered by me to be executed with all rigor, according to the decrees and laws of the Romans and Hebrews. Year of the creation of the world, 5,233, the 25th day of March. Pontius, Pontius Pilate, judge and governor of Lower Galilee for the Roman Empire, who signed the above with his own hand. According to the above reckoning, the creation of the world happened in March, and from the day on which Adam was created until the incarnation of the word, 5,199 years, adding the nine months during which he remained in the virginal womb of his most holy mother and the 33 years of his life, we complete the 5,233 years and three months, which according to the reckoning of the Romans intervened between the anniversary of his birth and the 25th of March, the day of his death. According to the reckoning of the Roman Church, there are not more than nine months and seven days to the first year, since it begins in count of years with the first of January of the second year of the world. Of all the opinions of the teachers of the Church, I have understood the one who co which corresponds to the reckoning of the Roman Church in the Roman Martyrology to be the correct one. This I have also stated in the chapter of the Incarnation of Christ our Lord in the first book of the second part, chapter 11. In the sentence of Pilate against our Savior, having been published in a loud voice before all the people, the executioners loaded the heavy cross on which he was to be crucified, Upon his tender and wounded shoulders, in order that he might carry it, they loosened the bonds. <clears throat> Excuse me. They loosened the bonds holding his hands, but not the others, since they wished to drag him along by the loose ends of the ropes that bound his body. In order to torment him the more, they drew two loops around his throat. The cross was fifteen feet long, of thick and heavy timbers. The herald began to proclaim the sentence, and the whole confused and turbulent multitude of the people, the executioners and soldiers, with great noise, uproar, and disorder, began to move from the house of Pilate to Mount Calvary through the streets of Jerusalem. The Master and Redeemer of the world, Jesus, before receiving the cross, looked upon it with a countenance full of extreme joy and exultation, which as would be shown by a bridegroom looking at the rich adornments of his bride and on receiving it, he addressed it as follows. O cross, beloved of my soul, now prepared and ready to steal my longings, come to me, that I may be received in thy arms, and that, attached to them as on an altar, I may be accepted by the Eternal Father as the sacrifice of his everlasting reconciliation with the human race. In order to die upon thee, I have descended from heaven and assumed mortal and passable flesh, for there art to be the scepter with which I shall triumph over all my enemies, the key with which I shall open the gates of heaven for all the predestined. Isaiah 22, 22. The sanctuary in which the guilty sons of Adam shall find mercy, and the treasure house for the enrichment of their poverty. Upon thee I desire to exalt and recommend dishonor and reproach among men, in order that my friends may embrace them with joy seek them with anxious longings, and follow me on the path which I, through thee, shall open up before them. My Father and eternal God, I confess thee as the Lord of heaven and earth, Matthew 11:25. Subjecting myself to thy power and to thy divine wishes, I take upon my shoulders the wood for the sacrifice of my innocent and passable humanity, and I accept it willingly for the salvation of men. Receive thou eternal father this sacrifice as acceptable to thy justice in order that from today on they may not any more be servants but sons and heirs of thy kingdom together with me romans eight seventeen. none of these sacred mysteries and happenings were hidden from the great lady of the world mary for she had a most intimate knowledge and understanding of them 
far beyond that of all the angels. The events which she could not see with the eyes of her body, she perceived by her intelligence and revealed science, which manifested to her the interior operation of her, of her most holy son. By his divine light, she recognized the infinite value of the wood of the cross after once it had come in contact with the deified humanity of Jesus, our Redeemer. Immediately, she venerated and adored it in a manner befitting it. The same was also done by the heavenly spirits attending upon the queen. She imitated her divine son in the tokens of affections with which he received the cross, addressing it in the words suited to her office as cojectrix of the Redeemer. By her prayers to the Eternal Father, she followed him in his exalted sentiments as the living original and exemplar, without failing in the least point. When she heard the voice of the herald publishing and rehearsing the sentence through the streets, the Heavenly Mother, in protest against the accusations contained in the sentence and in the form of comments on the glory and honor of the Lord, composed a canticle of praise and worship of the innocence and sinlessness of her all-holy Son and God. In the composing of this canticle, the holy angels helped her. Conjointly with them, she arranged and repeated it, while the inhabitants of Jerusalem were blaspheming their own Creator and Savior. As all the faith, knowledge, and love of creatures during this time of the Passion was enshrined in its highest essence in the magnanimous soul of the Mother of Wisdom, she alone had the most proper conception and correct judgment of the suffering and death of God for men. Without for a moment failing in the attention necessary to exterior actions, her wisdom penetrated all the mysteries of the redemption and the manner in which it was to be accomplished through the ignorance of the very men who were to be redeemed. She entered into the deepest consideration of the dignity of the one who was suffering, of what he was suffering, from and for whom he was suffering, of the dignity of the person of Christ our Redeemer, uniting within himself the divine and the human natures, of their perfections and attributes. The Most Blessed Mary alone possessed the highest and intuitive knowledge outside of the Lord himself. On this account, she alone among all mere creatures attached sufficient importance to the passion and death of her Son and of the true God. Of what he suffered, she was not only an eyewitness, but she experienced it personally within herself, occasioning the holy envy not only of men, but of the angels themselves, who were not thus favored. But they knew well that their great queen and mistress felt and suffered in soul and body the same torments felt and suffered in the soul and body. Oh, I'm sorry. The great queen and mistress felt and suffered in soul and body the same torments and sorrows as her most holy son and that of the holy trinity was inexpressibly pleased with her and therefore they sought to make up by their praise and worship for the pains which they could not share sometimes when the sorrowful mother could not personally witness the sufferings of her son she was made to feel in her virginal body and in her spirit the effects of his torments before her intelligence made her aware of them. Thus surprised, she would say, Ah, oh, what new martyrdom have they devised for my sweetest Lord and Master? And then she would receive the clearest knowledge of what the Lord was enduring. The most loving mother was so admirably faithful to, in her sufferings and in imitating the example of Christ our God that she never permitted herself any easement either of her bodily pains, such as, such as rest or nourishment or sleep, nor any relaxation of the spirit, such as any consoling thoughts or considerations, except when she was visited from on high by divine influence. Then only would she humbly and thankfully accept relief, in order that she might recover strength to attend still more fervently to the object of her sorrows and to the cause of his suffering. The same wise consideration she applied to the malicious behavior of the Jews and their servants, to the needs of the human race, to their threatening ruin, and to the ingratitude of men for whom he suffered. Thus she perfectly and intimately knew of all these things and felt it more deeply than all the creatures. A 
and other hidden and astonishing miracle was wrought by the right hand of God through the instrumentality of the blessed Mary against Lucifer and his infernal spirits. It took place in the following manner. The dragon and his associates, though they could not understand the humiliation of the Lord, were most attentive to all that happened in the passion of the Lord. Now when he took upon himself the cross, all these enemies felt a new and mysterious tremor and weakness, which caused in them great consternation and confusion, and confused distress. Conscious of these unwanted and invincible feelings, the prince of darkness feared that in the passion and death of Christ our Lord some dire and irreparable destruction of his reign was imminent. In order not to be overtaken by it in the presence of Christ our God, the dragon resolved to retire and fly with all his followers to the caverns of hell. But when he sought to execute this resolve, he was prevented by the great queen and mistress of all creation, for the Most High enlightening her and intimating to her what she was to do, at the same time invested her with his power. The Heavenly Mother, turning toward Lucifer and his squadrons by her imperial command, hindered them from flying, ordering them to await the witness and passion to the end on Mount Calvary. The demons could not resist the command of the mighty queen, for they recognized and felt the pa divine power operating in her. Subject to her sway, they followed Christ as so many prisoners dragged along in chains to Calvary, where the eternal wisdom had decreed to triumph over them from the throne of the cross, as we shall see later on. There is nothing which can exemplify the discouragement and dismay which from that moment began to oppress Lucifer and his demons. According to our way of speaking, they walked along to Calvary like criminals condemned to a terrible death and seized by the dismay and consternation of an inevitable punishment. This punishment of the demon was in conformity with his malicious nature and proportioned to the evil committed by him in introducing death and sin into the world to remedy which God himself was now undergoing death. All praise, glory, and honor be to our Savior, Jesus. May God bless and keep you.